Hi, I'm Lena Rao. Welcome to Ask a VC, where we put VCs in the hot seat. Today we are joined by NEA partner John Sakota. John, welcome to the studio. Thank you. I uh, just want to go into your bio. Um, Sakota joined NEA in 2006. You focus on investments in software as a service, infrastructure software, and big data applications, though I hate the word big data. Um, your investments include Blue Jeans Network, Desire to Learn, Hearsay Social, Opower, uh, Wibby Data, uh, Science Logic, among many others, and you co manage NEA's seed investment program, um, which actually leads me into my first question, which is why does a $2.6 billion fund need a seed investment program? Sure. So, um, as I think you know, NEA is a 35 year old firm. And um, our roots actually uh, originated here in Silicon Valley and also on the East Coast. And uh, we had primarily focused on working with uh, early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, as we began to raise more capital and raise larger venture capital funds, uh, our last fund was $2.6 billion. Prior to that, we had raised a $2.5 billion fund. We today actually manage uh, a little bit north of $13 billion. Uh, we were sending a signal to the marketplace that we were really only focused on later stage venture capital. Uh, and over the last decade, we've actually uh, been a part of some amazing seed investments and Series A investments in companies like uh, Tableau Software and Data Domain, and more recently, companies like Groupon. These are companies that we had uh, either seeded in our offices or led the initial Series A. And we felt there was a need to really uh, work with the early stage community and participate in the seed investments, which um, traditionally had, had um, required us to invest between one and three million dollars of capital. But uh, as companies have been able to do a lot more with less and they've been able to make a lot more progress on less capital, uh, we're now able to make 100,000, 200,000, uh, 500,000 dollar investments out of our main fund. And so uh, in 2011, we actually uh, allocated 20 million dollars to pursue seed investments. And today we've actually made uh, 50 investments uh, in some amazing companies across all the sectors that we invest in uh, and in multiple geographies. And I'm assuming it, uh, investments are going to continue at that space, at, the, uh, at that pace at the seed level. That's right. We, um, we're roughly doing four or five seed investments every quarter. Um, that may sound like a lot, but uh, there are you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies started every, every quarter. Mm -hmm. And um, we expect to continue to invest in seed opportunities for uh, the remainder of this fund. And um, uh, uh, our expectation is that we'll have anywhere between 20 to $30 million committed in all of our funds to seed investments. Uh, I want to talk about one thing I always hear from entrepreneurs when talking about having institutional firms as seed investors. If you don't you know, participate in the in the Series A or whatever that next round is. Um, what's you know they, they face that signaling risk. You know, if NEA doesn't go into that the next round, well, why are they not? You know, why are they not doubling down? Why are they not um, putting more money into the firm? What's your response to that concern? So we obviously spent a lot of time thinking about signaling risk. Yeah. Um, one of the most important things for us is maintaining great relationships. Uh, with our entrepreneurs and keeping a great reputation with our entrepreneurs. And we certainly didn't want to put that uh, in jeopardy by launching a seed program. Uh, so we spent a lot of time as a firm managing signaling risk. Uh, and we had talked to lots of entrepreneurs and other seed investors about um, whether or not our participation in these rounds would actually undermine our relationships with our entrepreneurs. Um, it's early days for us, but uh, the early data is actually very promising. So as I think I mentioned, we've made 50 investments, but we can actually track um, the uh, success of our uh, earlier investments by cohorts. And uh, in the first year and a half that we made seed investments, we invested in about 35 companies. And um, today, uh, roughly 14 or 15 of those companies uh, have raised Series A. Uh, and NEA has actually only led five of those investments. So um, there's been twice as many outside-led Series A's in our seed-funded companies than we've actually led Series mm -hmm. A. So uh, in many ways, the data actually uh, doesn't necessarily support the signaling risk thesis, at yeah. least for our portfolio. So you know, other VCs are still interested in these companies, even if you're not necessarily leading the next round. That's right. I think the perception was that we would be sending only negative signals right. about our companies. And the reality is, uh, when we look at a seed investment, we want to uh, work with great management teams. We're really excited about differentiated products. We're really excited about large market opportunities. 
And you know, these are characteristics that a lot of investors are looking for. And so I think um, people maybe underestimated the positive signal that we were sending when we were seeding a company. And um, certainly some of the early data would suggest that um, there are other great investors that want to invest in our early stage companies. So another reader question was sent and relates to seed uh, investing as well. Um, what is the appropriate way to structure a seed round? I mean, there's a lot of information out there, convertible, uh, debt, you know, what, what type of notes should, should they be, um, you know, signing? And, and so what, what's your perspective on that and how does NEA do it? So um, building a company is really, really hard. And I think one of the beautiful things uh, now about seed investing is you can construct a syndicate of people that can help you, uh, both in the very, very short term. Uh, there are a lot of things that companies need to do from ground zero, but also over the very long term. You, you need to plan for success and uh, figure out a way to work with an investor that wants to stay with you for a long period of time. And I think what we're seeing right now is really entrepreneurs are building syndicates to help them uh, not only solve their short-term needs, whether they be having specific product or specific types of business development expertise, but also working with a firm that has a global perspective, that has uh, a very long-term investment focus, and is willing to help shape a company for what it means to be more than three or four people and a product idea to actually being a very large standalone company that um, someday may go public and may be worth multiple billions of dollars. And so um, I think the entrepreneurs that are privileged enough to select their investors are really looking at, uh, at their syndicate as mm -hmm. a series of different uh, types of value add. What do you think of party round, speaking of that syndicate? I, I think the term party round and syndicate are in some ways synonymous. Yeah. Um, I certainly think that there are diminishing marginal returns to having too many investors uh, in your round. Yeah. Uh, and so if you take, um, uh, if you take the party to an extreme, uh, you may not get the same amount of value out of each of the individual investors. Right, that you like have. 50 investors or exactly. you know, some of the, the sort of crazy numbers we've seen from certain startups. Exactly. But I, I think it's uh, if you pick the right number of people and you pick the right people, That's right. Uh, you're likely to have a more successful outcome than if you do the reverse. That's right. Well, we're going to switch gears away from the seed investment uh, topic, but um, I want to talk about you know, actually what you invest in, which is enterprise data focused. Um, companies, uh, what one reader question was: What is the next phase for data and the, these these Hadoop-based technologies um, in the enterprise world? So, if you think about enterprise software, I mean, we're really going through a major renaissance today. Uh, in the late '90s, we invented a lot of large categories of enterprise software in the client-server era. Uh, companies like Siebel invented CRM. Companies like PeopleSoft invented HRM, and companies like SAP. Uh, invented ERP. And really over the last decade, uh, all we've really done is host or, or move those same applications into the cloud. And uh, what we're seeing right now is actually the ability for entrepreneurs to really rethink what enterprise software should be and actually rewrite and reimagine enterprise software for business users. And data or data analytics plays a big role in that. Um, we're seeing companies want to personalize the application experience more to individual users or individual businesses or individual verticals. And as you can imagine, the more data that you have and the more industry-specific data that you, that you have, the more personalized and the more powerful the software application can be. So, so give me an example of that. Sure. So um, when companies use technologies like Hadoop, they're able to actually collect and gather and analyze a lot more data than they could using more structured and legacy technologies. And what that allows them to do is actually design applications which previously could never have been built. Uh, one example is a software as a service company in my portfolio called Opower. Opower today um, goes to utilities and helps them to um, interact with their consumers by using a big data application. They actually take uh, meter data from roughly the homes of half the country and they overlay everything from socioeconomic data to homeowner data to weather data, and they're actually able to provide you as a pg and &E customer with really customized tips as to how you can save money on your energy bill. And there are a whole number of, of um, uh, very complex technologies that allow Opower to deliver what seems like a very simple insight to you, so you can either change your thermostat or upgrade your pool pump or uh, change your lighting. And uh, in a very, very simple personalized experience, you're able to act. Underlying all of that is a lot of very complex big data technology. Mm -hmm. 
It's very, very similar to how Amazon today uh, knows exactly what book you want to buy next or what product you want to buy next. It looks very, very simple how they do that. It's very, very complicated underneath the covers. Well, uh, John, I really appreciate you stopping by the studio. Thanks so much. Thank you.